الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله وبعد إن شاء الله continuing on our series of the journey of the heart and uh, where we left off last week or uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we had talked about the cure of ignorance is the question. And we talked about the dangers of answering a question without knowledge or making a hukum or a ruling in Islam of halal and haram without knowledge. And we showed in the hadith how the man uh, actually was killed by that because the people gave him a fatwa responding to his question and they had no knowledge to do so and he ended up dying from his wounds. So we mentioned all the... Uh, ayat and some of the hadith of being careful of what you say about Allah Azza wa Jal and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To continue on that same uh, section, inshallah, it, so we know the dangers of speaking without knowledge and the next part is basically choosing who you seek your knowledge from. Like the scholars used to say, you know, إِنَّ هَذَا أَمْرُ الدِّينَ فَانْظُرْ عَلَى مَنْ تَأْخُدْ دِينَكَ Like this, is, this affair, this knowledge is a religion, so be careful from who you take your religion. Right, and connecting the two is a story by uh, one of the Fuqaha Sab'a Medina at the time of the Tabi'een it was one of the most uh, knowledge filled places on the face of the earth because you had many of the Sahaba's offsprings and all the scholars would come there to seek knowledge from the Sahaba right? so you had thousands of scholars in Medina from all these thousands of scholars and ulama seven were the top of them so you can imagine how knowledgeable these seven are. They're called the Fuqaha Sab'a. And from them was uh, Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad, rahimahullah. He was one of the great uh, scholars of Islam in Medina, and he was one of the Fuqaha Sab'a. So he had a statement you know, at the time which kind of covers both of these uh, subjects in terms of not speaking or speaking, not answering a question that you uh, don't have knowledge about, and also not being fooled by the appearances you know so from the from the signs of a scholar you don't have to look at the appearances as much as what's in his heart and what's in his mind and the knowledge he keeps and the character he teaches and he acts upon you know sometimes people will be fooled by a long beard or a high thobe or something like that and think just because he has a long beard he's a scholar and i'm not saying this is uh you know of course we, don't, we love the sunnah for the long beard, alhamdulillah, and, and, and following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu But that's not the sign of a scholar. Because many people have these outward signs, but they have no knowledge whatsoever. So Imam uh, Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad, rahimahullah, he said that uh, he was asked a question. And he was one of the big teachers, I said, like the, the seven scholars of, the, of Medina. So they came and asked him a, a question. And he said, la uhsinu. Like, I'm not able to answer it, basically. It's not my, my, my specialty. I won't answer it. And uh, one of the students said, you know, you, you won't answer. You don't know. You, you're supposed to be this big scholar and everything. You won't answer. And he said, you know, He said, don't be fooled by the length of my beard and all these people you see around me. For verily by Allah, I don't know it. I, don't, I, don't, I can't answer it. So two points that he's covering here is not speaking without knowledge and also not being fooled by appearances, you know. And I remember uh, uh, Brother Yasser Qadi, he mentioned in uh, one of his uh, lectures recently, I, I was uh, able to meet up with him, and he reminded me of the days in Medina when we were students, alhamdulillah. Like in those days, mashallah, the, the hajjaj and the pilgrims, a lot of times they would ask us questions or they know who the students of, of Medina were. Like we'd had a certain vibe, I guess, about us. And they always ask questions. And many of them, subhanAllah, they would like ask you questions based upon the length of your beard. Like so if you're with a bunch of brothers, they would see like who had the longest beard and then they would go and ask him. And he remember, reminded me of this and I was, I was laughing. And he also mentioned a story personally. He said like one time there was uh, him and two other brothers and they all had pretty much the same length of beard. So he said a guy came up to them and he was like looking and he was confused because they all had the same length of beard. So then he went down and looked at their stomachs, whoever the bigger stomach, you know, would probably have more knowledge. <laughs> so all these appearances, in the, alhamdulillah, they don't really answer 
uh, or they don't, <laughs> they don't mean that you're knowledgeable. So don't be fooled by it. And another story, a brother told me from, from Philly, like back in the day, he was uh, at a masjid and this you know, man, like a sheikh came in, he was wearing the, the white thobe, he had like a nice beard, gray beard, the imama, you know, turban. And he looked like a, a sheikh. So the imam didn't show up. So they were like, you know, tafaddal, sheikh. You go ahead. You can lead us in salat. So he went up in the, in the do you know the story? <laughs> he, he went up into the, uh, you know, to lead the prayers. And he was like, you know, Allahu Akbar. And then he just started like saying rubbish, like blah, 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 blah. Like, like you know, I don't know exactly what it was. but <laughs> So everybody was like, huh? He didn't even know Arabic. He didn't know one swear of the Quran. And then the people in the Salat, they were like from the hood, like the, you know, the, the poor neighborhoods. And they're, they're new to Islam too. But so he's like, you know, get that, you know, he would the derogatory term, get that, you know, so-and-so out of here right now in the middle of Salat. So, so the point is, Yanni, we shouldn't be fooled about the, the length of the beard or the thobe or all this stuff. But the real scholars, they're the ones that have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and true knowledge that testify to it, the, the ulama and the students of knowledge. You know, so this is what our, our criteria is. <coughs> Some of the scholars they say like for you to be an alim or a mujtahid that you should have to know the ayat of the Quran or the Quran completely and the ahadith of ahkam and the uh, ijma of the ummah like anytime there's a consensus of the ummah all of the ijma'at and usul al fiqh you know the principles of how to derive the uh, fiqh rulings and a uh, master the Arabic language and other requirements too so there's many shuroot to be an alim and we try our best to, you try to find the person that's most knowledgeable to seek your knowledge from especially when it comes to fatwa uh, in terms of seeking knowledge inshallah so I wanted to continue upon this subject we know not to speak without knowledge we know to try to find the scholars the best scholars we can to seek knowledge and now the uh, the benefits of, of, of knowledge um, one of the great gifts of Allah Azza wa Jal to to human beings is the aql or the ilm the knowledge you know, and from our purpose of creation, there are two main purposes: to worship Allah Azza wa Jal, and to be the Khalifa on the earth. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wama khalqtu al-jinna wal-insa illa liyabudun." I did not create humankind or jinn except that they should worship me, <coughs> right? And also, Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, "Inni ja'al fil ardi Khalifa." I'm making upon the earth a Khalifa. So these are the two main purposes of, of humankind. To worship Allah Azza wa Jal, that's the first and foremost, that's our purpose of creation, and to take care of this earth. We inherit the earth to take care of it, to live upon it, and to live by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's law. Both of these duties obviously require knowledge, because you can't worship Allah Azza wa Jal in truth without knowledge. And you can't know your position on the earth or take care of the earth or help other human beings without knowledge. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He did ikram to, to mankind by giving him this knowledge. He says to the angels, With qada rubuk al-malak inni ja'an fil alli khalifa, qalu wa taj'alu fiha ma yusidu fiha wa yusfiku al-dima, wa nahnu nusabbihuka, wa nusabbihu bihamnika wa nuqaddisu lak, qala inni ya'an wa ma la ta'lamun. So Allah says, when your Lord said to the angels, we are going to uh, put a viceroy on the earth, a khalifa, and we will set, and the angels said, like, are you going to put someone on the earth that's going to cause corruption and spill blood? And we praise you and, and glorify you. Indeed, Allah says, I know which you do not know. Right? And then when you read this ayats further on Surah Al-Baqarah, with قَالَ رَبُكَ لَمَا قَالُوا سُبْحَانَكَ لَا عِلْمَ إِلَّا مَا عَلَّمْتَ وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا ثُمَّ عَرَضَهُمْ عَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةَ that Allah subhanahu wa taught Adam all the, the things that is necessary for him. And then he told the angels basically like, you know, do as he did. And they couldn't do it. They, called, they said, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana. We have no knowledge except that which you have taught us, right? And further on in the ayats in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the angels to bow down to Adam, right? Because of this glory that he given him in, in knowledge. So knowledge is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has akrama abni or bani Adam. Knowledge is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises up the son of Adam. And also, subhanAllah, this is how we are distinguished from the lower uh, animals and the beasts through knowledge. You know, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, there's two main extremes, basically. You have the angels, and they have, uh, you know, basically duties and responsibilities, but no desires, you know. 
taklifa bidun shahawat. So they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without sin. And they obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they don't they disobey Allah azza wa jal. In the other extremes you have the animals. And they have uh, shahawat with no taklifa. Like they have desires but no responsibilities. That's why we're allowed to you know, you know, have uh, meats and stuff like that because they don't have real taklifa or, or responsibilities. Not, it's not like a human being. So those are the two, two extremes, you know. And the humans, subhanAllah, they combine them both. We have taklifa, we are responsible and we have duties to fulfill as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us. And we also have shahawat, right? So this is like, uh, it can be the best of both worlds because you can raise yourself up to the highest levels above the angels as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us with, uh, Imam, uh, with uh, Adam alayhi salam. Or you can be lower than the lowest of animals. You know, when you just follow the desires only and you forget about the taklif or the responsibilities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We said uh, about the angels being, you know, in the high levels. The Prophet is showing this, this action when you actually recite the Qur'an, for example, you are with the angels, you know, in the high levels. And in the other ayat, they show how if you uh, act like the animals, you go to lower than them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, about the people that held the book and did not uh, practice it. You know, asfara. They're like the, method, the example of the donkey carrying books, right? Having knowledge but not acting upon it. So it's showing that they didn't fulfill the responsibility and they followed their shahawat. Another one is kamathri kalbi in tahmil alayhi yalhath or tatruku yalhath. Another example of those who, who follow the desires and leave what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded, Allah co compares them to a dog, like lagging his tongue, right? In another ayah, Allah says, Balhum adal, comparing the man or the humans to the animals, He said they're worse than the animals, they're more lower than the animals. So these are the two extremes, and we need the knowledge, of course, to fulfill our duties and responsibilities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to control our shahawat. Uh, knowledge is of two types, Fard Ayn and Fard Kifaya. Fard Ayn is what every Muslim needs in order to fulfill their religion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Fard Kifaya is anything beyond that. So you need to know, um, well let me give you guys a quick quiz. For example, do you know the Sharut of the Shahada? Like when you say the Shahada, La ilaha illallah, this kalima, it has some requirements. Does anybody know what the requirements are? Not the uh, requirements of the, the kilima of itself that for it to be correct. Knowledge, ilm, that's one of them. Okay. Huh? No, he said uh, those are different shuru. Those are for taklif, like to be responsible as a human being. You have to be aqil, balig, uh, you know, all, all these other requirements. But I'm talking about Knowing the meaning of La ilaha illallah, there's like seven requirements to have that meaning correct in your understanding after you've become aqil and baligh, after you reach the age of puberty and you are sane. So that meaning should have, there's, there's some scholars say seven requirements for that meaning to be correct or understood or to, to have your shahada accepted. So this is like a basic, this is our most important pillar of Islam that, that gets us in and many people don't know this, you know. Inshallah we fulfill it without, because it's, it's common sense. But isn't it better to know, you know? So just quickly, al-almu wal-yaqinu wal-qubulu wal-inqiyadu fidri ma aqulu wal-sidqu wal-ikhlasu wal-muhabba wa faqna Allahu ni ma yuhabba. Those are the seven requirements of la ilaha illallah. You can go back, inshallah, and look them up. But the first requirement, most importantly, is al-alm, knowing who Allah Azza wa Jal is. You know, if you bear witness to something when you say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, you're bearing witness to the oneness of Allah, correct? Yes? <laughs> okay. Or if you bear witness to something in the court and you're a witness, you have to have seen that matter or know that matter in order to bear witness, correct? Right. What is bearing false witness when you don't, you know, when you bear witness and you don't know? Lying. It could be lying or shahadat zur, the false testimony, right? And that's one of the greatest of sins. So imagine in your shahada of la ilaha illallah, you don't really know what you're talking about. You don't know who Allah is, you don't know who the Prophet is. But you're bearing witness, right? So we must know. 
And you can go along the other faraid of your deen. So if I ask somebody what the wajibat of salat is, or the arkan of salat, or the wajibat of wudu, and you're not able to answer, that means you should go back and study because these are the fard upon you. If you don't know how to make salat correctly, if you don't know how to fast correctly, if you don't know how to make the pilgrimage correctly, then you have a naqas in the deen. And you're not fulfilling your obligation. So this is what we're talking about, fard ayn. Also, if you're doing something in uh, a particular area, like for example, you're a business person, then it's obligatory upon you to know the rulings of business in the area that you're working in. This is when fard ayn. And then fard kifaya is something that the scholars can go on if you want to be more scholarly and, and, and learn more, for example, the, the extra uh, the knowledges, then that's fard kifaya. Some people are obligated to do it, but not everybody. And of course, we're all encouraged, inshallah, to seek knowledge as much as we can because of the great blessings, you know. Uh, we mentioned before the beginning of this series, uh, the three main reasons we seek knowledge. The first one we said is because it is obligatory upon us. Yes, and the ayah we said, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ Know there is nobody worthy of worship except Allah and seek forgiveness of your sins. And Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he used to have a chapter in his book, or he does have a chapter in his book saying, Al-Almu qabl al-Qawli wal-Amal Knowledge before speech and action. And he uses this ayah as a proof. Because Allah is saying no first, and then he's saying ask for forgiveness. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Ali Imran, Kunu uh, Rabbaniin, be of those who are like the the caretakers, the ones that have knowledge. Ibn Abbas did a tafsir of this. So Allah is commanding us to have scholars in our ummah to raise the ummah up. Also, Allah says, Fast alu ahl dhikri in kuntum la ta'lamun. Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. All these are commands. In the first ayah we mentioned before, of course, that was revealed to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ Read in the name of your Lord. So we are ummah of iqra. We are ummah of knowledge. And we don't stop seeking knowledge. And we're obligated to seek knowledge. That's part of our deen. And we take pride in that. <coughs> also from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, an Anas bin Malik قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم طلب العلم فريدة على كل مسلم Seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim. And this was related by Ibn Majah. Also, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he says that nobody sins against Allah Azza wa Jal except through jahl, ignorance. So literally, you sin against Allah because you have ignorance that this is not haram or, or, or halal, for example, you don't know better, or that you sin knowingly but you're ignorant of the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the ignorant of the hellfire and the punishment of the hellfire right. so the point here like the scholars say مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ بِهِ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ wajib. that which you cannot complete the obligation that you cannot complete except with something that becomes obligatory upon you as well so fighting against ignorance is also obligatory upon a Muslim right and the opposite of ignorance is Knowledge. Some of the blessings of seeking knowledge, um, there are many ayat, inshallah, we'll go through a couple of them and, and a couple of the hadith. But first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illa huwa wal malaikatu wa lil almi qa'iman bil qist. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He bears witness, there's no one worthy of worship except Him and the angels and those who have knowledge. Establishing Established with justice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is raising the scholars up to his shahada and the shahada of the angels. What higher level can anybody ask for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah raises in levels those who believe amongst you and those who have knowledge, darajat, high levels. قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are those equal who know and those who don't know? It's a rhetorical question. Of course they're not equal. And another ayah, إِنَّمَا يَغْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Verily, the ones who fear Allah, truly fear Allah and know Allah are the scholars. 
also in Surah Taha, the Prophet ﷺ, he was commanded to seek uh, an increase in knowledge. If you look in the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ was never asked to ask for an increase in anything of the dunya except this ayah here about knowledge. zidni alma, And say, my Lord, increase me in knowledge. And Allah SWT says in Surah Al-Ankabut, وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَارُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ And these are the examples that we uh, put forth, or the metaphors we put forth for the people. And no one can understand them except Al-Alimun, the ones that have knowledge. So to have true knowledge, only those that have true knowledge can really understand these amthal of the Qur'an. To understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words. And there's many, many other ayat, inshallah, you get the idea of the blessings, the great blessings and rewards of, of knowledge. You know, the, being up there with the shahada of Allah and the malaika, being raised high in ranks. Having true fear of Allah, true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being of those who can understand the Qur'an. In the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu the Prophet sallallahu he said, مَنْ يُرَدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he wants good for, he makes him knowledgeable in the deen. In another narration, لَا حَسَدًا إِلَّا فِي اثْنَتَيْنِ رجل أتاه الله مالا فصلته على هلكته في الحق ورجل أتاه الله الحكمة فهو يقضي بها ويعلمها that there's no jealousy and this is like the permissible form of jealousy except in two instances a person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him wealth and he spends of it until he, he loses it uh, all in, in Sabi Allah for the path of Allah and another person who Allah has given wisdom to and he teaches the people with it and he benefits from it so these are two people that we can have aspire to be like. Also the Prophet ﷺ, he said, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whoever seeks a path in which he is trying to attain knowledge, Allah will make a path to paradise easy for him. So if you want a path to paradise made easy to you, this is the path, seeking knowledge, knowing how to get closer to your Lord. Understanding your deen, knowing the seerah of your Prophet Another narration: إِذَا مَاتَ ابْنَ آدَمْ انْقَطَعْ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثٍ That when a person passes away, his actions stop except for three things. Anybody know what they are? When we're talking about here, right? عِلْمٌ يَنْتَفَعُ بِهِ Knowledge that you can benefit from or you leave to benefit other people benefit from. And waladun salih, a pious offspring that makes dua for his parents. And the last one, sadaqatun jariya, a continuous charity, right? So these are the three things that your actions can continue. So one of the main ones is having uh, knowledge that you leave behind. Also to have a pious child, you need knowledge, you know, to raise him up correctly. And also to know which form of sadaqah, you need to know the halal and haram so you can have uh, halal rizq provision and you can spend from halal rizq your sadaqah is accepted so all of these require knowledge that's why Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah he says that knowledge or seeking knowledge is better than a nawafil because a nawafil is something that stops in the dunya whereas the knowledge will continue in the akhirah also the Prophet sallallahu he said من خرج في طلب العلم فهو في سبيل الله whoever goes out in the, the way of knowledge, trying to achieve knowledge, he is in the path of Allah. And if you're on the path of Allah, you have no fear. In another, there's many other narrations to summarize. One, when a person goes out to scholars, or, or a person becomes a scholar, or he's seeking to be a scholar, the um, angels cover him with their wings and protect him. And everything in the heavens and the earth make dua for him even the fish in the sea and the ants in the ground. So imagine if you have a correct niyyah and you're going to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seek knowledge and learn about your deen, imagine all the birds, all the fish, all the ants making dua for you. And the angels protecting you, covering you up. What more blessings can you ask for? You know? Because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to achieve in this dunya blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's the only thing we can take with us to the next life and the more 
paths that we can go upon that will increase us in our blessings, the more we should strive to those paths. So Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he said that people are in need of uh, knowledge more than they are in need of food and drink. Because food and drink is just for the body, whereas knowledge is for the heart and the soul. If your physical body dies, it's not as important as your spiritual body. If your spiritual body, your spiritual being dies, that's very dangerous. Like if your heart and soul die from lack of spiritual nutrition, and they have the black heart or the dead heart, we talked about earlier, how that can lead to the hellfire. So we have to be very careful to have the knowledge to enlive our, our hearts and our souls and our spirit. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he was asked if a person had only one hour left of his life, what should he do with it? And he answered by that he should seek knowledge. And the student said, even if he's not able to uh, act upon it, he said, even if he's not able to act upon it, his seeking knowledge is an action in and of itself, and he will get rewards for that. So these are the scholars that know, you know, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, the greatest scholars, uh, amongst the greatest scholars of Islam, they know the value of knowledge, you know. And these are encouraging us to spend our time and our efforts to, to, to seek knowledge. So, and the third reason we mentioned is um, the logical point of view. As we said, هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ Are those who know equal to those who do not know? Right? Logically, they're not equal. The knowledgeable person can never be equal to an ignorant person, right? If you call somebody, you know, dummy, stupid, ignorant, whatever, they're not going to be thankful for it. They're going to be kind of upset. Even if they're the most ignorant of people, if you call somebody dumb, they're going to take it as an insult, right? Whereas knowledge, if you call a person knowledgeable or brilliant or smart, they're going to be very happy. You know, even if they're ignorant and they get called smart, they're like, you know, mashallah. <laughs> So knowledge is always, logically, it's a praiseworthy thing to have. And ignorance is an uh, unpraiseworthy thing to have. And you find this in all of the civilizations or the great civilizations in the history of the earth. And knowledge is always praiseworthy and held in high esteem. And ignorance is always looked down upon. Right? And in any field, this is the case. But imagine in your deen of Islam, what more honor is there to have than to be knowledgeable in the deen of Islam. Right. Um, some of the aids in, in seeking knowledge, uh, the scholars mention, uh, first and foremost, al-ikhlas, having sincerity for Allah Azza wa Jal. That you're seeking knowledge to please Allah, to lift the ignorance from your heart so that you can worship Him better. And Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he said, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ الْخَشْيَةِ Verily, knowledge is fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're getting knowledge to, to get closer to Allah. Secondly, uh, having taqwa, right? Being careful uh, to please Allah and to stay away from the haram. All these subjects you can get into like a deep lecture, but we don't have much time, so I'm just going to go through it like rather quickly, inshallah. But you can ask me later or go and study on these adab. There's many books about the seeking of knowledge and how to seek knowledge pr correctly. You know, Ibn Abdul Bar, he has Fadl uh, Al-Ilm, uh, and there's Faqih Al-Mutafaqih, also, I think, by al khabtib Al-Baghdadi. These are like two volumes about seeking knowledge, right? And there's a small book, it's called uh, by Bakr Abu Zaid, also, Hilyat uh, Al-Talab Al-Ilm. Uh, I think it's translated in English as well. I'll try to look for it for you guys, inshallah. But it's a smaller book, and it gives you nice advice in seeking knowledge. But anyway, I'm just mentioning some of the characteristics. So we said Al-Ikhlas, uh, Taqwa. Ikhtiyar al-shaykh, like seeking a, a scholar or a, a person to help you in the way that combines knowledge and character and good manners. Uh, some scholars say ghurba. Ghurba means being strange, right? So they say there's two types of, of strangeness in the sense that you're strange because like the Prophet Sallallahu said, بِدَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبٌ وَسَيُعُودُ غَرِيبًا فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاء Islam started out strange and it will return to being strange. So blessed are the strangers, or Tuba will be a nice tree in paradise for the strangers, right? So the scholars say, like in Talab al-Ilm, 
this, this, this person that's seeking knowledge, he's so keen on seeking knowledge that he shuts out a lot of other stuff. So he's kind of strange. Like, he doesn't care about going to the parties. He doesn't care about being the most popular. He doesn't care about going out to eat all the time. He'd rather go in and sit with the books and become knowledgeable and learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'd sit in the halaqat of dhikr or the halaqat of ilm and become knowledgeable. So this is strange amongst the people. And then other scholars define it as being like literally gharib, which is the sense that you travel, you know, you get out of the, uh, this place that you're living because there's too many distractions, you know. And this is not easy for everybody, but you can take the, the um, metaphorical meaning and sense of being uh, strange and that you try your best to seek knowledge even if it means being strange to other people. You know, if you're able to go overseas and study with other scholars, alhamdulillah, but don't ever make that like an impediment to you seeking knowledge because you can seek knowledge anywhere, now, especially nowadays with the uh, technology we have, alhamdulillah. The best, don't get me wrong, is to sit at the feet of the shiuch and, 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 and understand and learn from them directly, of course. But if you're not able to, alhamdulillah, you have you know, people of knowledge close by that have some knowledge that can help you. And also you have like the uh, technology, you can get videos and stuff like that as well. But always strive to, to make knowledge, seeking knowledge, a point where it takes precedence over other affairs in your life. Um, another characteristic is a tawada, having a humbleness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking knowledge. So tawada, uh, you can have um, humbleness, like Allah subhanahu uh, the Prophet says, Man tawada lillahi raf'ahu Allah. Whoever humbles himself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will raise him up, right? So it's always for a Muslim good to be humble no matter what. But especially when you're seeking knowledge, you know, you don't want to come off as like you know everything to your teacher. You don't want to come up and think, I don't need to study because I already know that. No, you have to humble yourself to knowledge and Allah will give you more knowledge. You know? um, some scholars, they say, uh, al jua or hunger. And... This means, not literally like you don't have to starve yourself to death to seek knowledge, but <laughs> the scholars, they say like, you know, don't make the shahawat your, your main focus, like eating and drinking and planning all your events around these type of physical things. You know, like some scholars, they say, I think it was Imam Ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah, and others, it's a popular saying, لا ينال العلم براحة الجسم. Knowledge is not achieved with the relaxation of the body. So don't make like food and sleep and drink and all this stuff your, your, your everything. That's what they're saying basically. So have some hunger and strive and like sacrifice for it. Um, also, al-wara or having extra piety. So some things might be doubtful. As a student of knowledge, it's better to stay away from the doubtful matters. You know, even though it might be halal, alhamdulillah, but when you're on that path, the scholars say to try to stay away from those things that are doubtful so you can focus on those that are not doubtful and and be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the Prophet said, he said, that ma yuribuk ila ma la yuribuk. Stay, um, leave that which is doubtful for that which is not doubtful. And another uh, point the scholars say is al uh, mukhatara, which is kind of like taking a risk. You know, sometimes you gotta take risks. They say, you know, go big or go home. So when you're trying to seek knowledge, sometimes you might have to, you know, go to places that are you know, off the grid or you have to travel and it's kind of like dangerous or you risk, you know, sometimes you want to seek knowledge and you're giving up other things to seek knowledge and it might be risky for you. You know, some people like leave their their job to take a lesser job so they can have more time to focus on seeking knowledge. So that's what the scholars mean here by uh, taking a risk. And N is the most valuable commodity that you can attain, so it's worth the risk, you know. Like they say sometimes in business, you have to take a big risk to have a big reward. The same thing with scholars. You have to sometimes take risks so you can get more for more knowledge. Mukhalafat uh, al-hawa, like going against your lower desires. You know, the more you train yourself to be uh, less impeded by your lower desires, the stronger you get, and the closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala you get. Allah, yu'allimakum Allah. Fear Allah, and Allah will teach you. Al-amal, uh, acting upon the knowledge that you have. You know, the, the more knowledge you get, the more responsibility you have, and the more you have to act upon it. Suhba uh, al having a good companion. In seeking knowledge, it's good to have a, a companion to help you in it, inshallah. It's like somebody that you can compete with or they can at least review with you. 
and it gives you encouragement. You know, for example, you want to memorize the Quran, tell somebody you trust that you know that you depend on that he's a good person or she's a good person. You know, I want to memorize the Quran. Can you can we help each other? Alhamdulillah. Or I want to go study such and such. Can you help me? And in, uh, in, in he's taking notes. For example, we can compare notes. It's good to have suhb al Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Al waqt and al sabr. Basically, taking time to learn the knowledge. You know, you can't just get it like that. You know, scholars spend years and years and years to attain this this gift, and it's a struggle. And you have to have patience, sabr. You know, don't give up. The more you strive and the more you struggle, the more Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will make it easy for you. You know, sometimes when it's mem- you're memorizing things, it becomes hard. But if you keep at it and you make dua and you're sincere and you're leaving the sins and getting closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Allah will make it easier and easier for you. You know, for before it could be hard to memorize one ayah, and then Subhanallah, you, Allah opens up upon you where you can memorize, you know, two or three pages at a time of the Quran, for example. So don't give up. You know, always keep striving. You know, the shaitan wants you to be ignorant. The shaitan doesn't want you to seek knowledge. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us good. So that's why he's ordered us to seek knowledge. Uh, finally, the zakat al-ilm is teaching to others. So when you learn something, teach what you learn. The Prophet said, he said, Ballagh anni walaw ayah. Relate for me even if it's just one ayah. And the more you teach, alhamdulillah, the more you actually ingrain it into your hearts and into your minds. You know. So you learn something, alhamdulillah, go share it with a friend. Go share it with your family. Make a small halaqah at home and sit together and study. You know, this is from Tazkiyat al ilm Because what's the benefit if you have all this knowledge but you don't share it with other people? Or you don't act upon it? It's hujjatan alik, you know. There's many warnings in the Quran for, the deen, for those people who cover up knowledge. You know. We want, we're not selfish, we want everybody to benefit, we want everybody to go, as many people we can, to go into the paradise, right? So it's obligatory upon us to learn and to teach. I think we can break here, inshallah, and then I'll, uh, inshallah, to continue where we left off, we mentioned some of the, uh, we were talking about some of the aids in helping us to seek knowledge, and uh, inshallah, to continue on that, I thought it would be good to demonstrate or to tell you all about some of the stories of those who sought knowledge before us. And there are many, inshallah, but to inspire us. And the, the best or one of the greatest stories of talab al-ilm or seeking knowledge is the story of, anybody know? Musa, Musa alayhi salam. <laughs> That's one of the greatest stories of talab al-ilm, seeking knowledge. And this was illustrating the point that we mentioned earlier, that you have to have humbleness in, in seeking knowledge. Musa is the Rasulullah, one of the greatest of the prophets, Uli al-Azm, of the five prophets, right? And yet when he said he had, uh, when he was asked, he was sitting in a, in a lesson amongst the children of Israel teaching them. And one of them asked him, you know, who was the most knowledgeable person? And he thought being, he is the Rasul, uh, the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Nabi, that he was the most knowledgeable, so he said, I am. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected him and said, no, there's a person named Al-Khidr in such and such place where the two uh, seas meet that is more knowledgeable, or that has more knowledge, in a sense. And so Musa, alayhi salam, he went and he sought this person out to seek knowledge. So it's showing the humbleness of Musa, alayhi salam, and he, even though he's a prophet of Allah and a messenger of Allah, he went on his path to seek knowledge. And he said to his um, traveling companion, some say that's, uh, you know, Yusha ibn Nun, with Qala Musa li fatahu la abrahu hatta abalagu majma' al bahrini al bahrini o amdiya hukuba. Musa said to, this, to the boy, I will go on his journey uh, until I've reached the two seas, even if I have to spend like a long, long time and struggle. So even like some scholars translate that as years. You know, the Musa alayhi salam said he would travel years just to meet that, that teacher to get the knowledge. And in this journey, you can go back and read it in Surah Al-Kaf for the more details. But, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a sign to where he would find this, this teacher. But we read in the Quran also, we mentioned uh, earlier, remember in the aids of seeking knowledge, even though everybody's eating, alhamdulillah, we said al jua or having some hunger, right? So Musa, he was going on his journey and traveling 
and tired and he, until the point that he was very hungry and he asked you know, his, uh, the traveling companion, the servant boy, that he can stop and have some food and some rest. So it's showing in Talib al how you strive and how you, you sacrifice to get the knowledge. Also, he illustrates the point in the Mukhatara, we said, that he you know, takes chances because when he, was with, when he met Al-Khidr, you know, uh, we'll go through the story, inshallah, so little by little. فلما بلغ مجمع بينهما نسي حوتهما فتخذ سبيله في البحر صربا فلما جاوز قال لفتاه آتنا غداءنا لقد لقينا من سفرنا هذا نصبا so this is when he asked for the, the meal because he said that we are you know, very tired from our journey and seeking knowledge قال أريد أذوينا إلى الصخر فإني نسيت الحوت وما أنسانه إلا الشيطان وأن أذكره واتخذ سبيله في البحر عجبا so the boy said you know did you see uh, when we took shelter at the rock I forgot the fish and none but the shaitan, the Satan made me forget it. And um, it made its way into the sea in a, an amazing manner. And this is the sign that Musa was looking for anyway to find Khidr. He said, this is what we were looking for. So they returned, retracing their footsteps. You know, all this travel for the feast of Allah to seek knowledge. So they found one of our servants, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servant, that we have given mercy, Allah has given mercy to, and taught him uh, of, from his own knowledge. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught this person, Khidr, the knowledge. Musa said to him, can I follow you? And, and, and you can teach me some of the things that you uh, were taught. So this is a lesson in humbleness as well. Musa, he didn't say, teach me what you know. He said, can I follow you so that you can teach me? And he's asking him, can you teach me? From some of what you know. He didn't say, teach me everything you know. You know, this is the adab of the talib. Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us in his messenger, Musa alayhi salam. Qala innaka lan tastati'a ma'ay sabra. Al-Khidr said that you won't have patience with me. This is the other thing we mentioned in talib al-end, that you have to have sabr and patience when you're seeking knowledge. Even though things might be hard, that's the shaitan trying to distract you from the path. You have to continue and be patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you tawfiq. وَكَيْفَ تَصْبِرُ عَلَى مَا لَمْ تُحِطْ بِهِ خُبْرًا And how will you have patience upon that which you know not of? قَالَ سَتَجْرِنِي إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ صَابِرًا وَلَا عَسِي لَكَ أَمْرًا Musa said that I will be patient and I won't um, disobey you in any matter. Then uh, Khidr told him, uh, if you follow me, basically, uh, you have to have, don't ask me anything until I uh, mention it to you. قال فإن اتبعتني فلا تسألني عن شيء حتى أحدث لك منه ذكرى فانطلق حتى إذا ركب في سفينة خرقها so they went and they uh, got into a boat that uh, Khidr had made a hole in it so it would sink right and we mentioned also earlier about some of the aids in seeking knowledge that you have to take chances so Musa is taking a great chance he's going in a, into a boat that he knows is going to sink in the, in the middle of the ocean right but for Fisabil Talib al Alm, in the path of seeking knowledge, he's taking this risk so he can get some knowledge from this man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him has some great knowledge. So he goes on, and uh, you know the story, inshallah, you can go back and get the more details. But basically, after the three instances, the Khidr said, Hada firaq wa wa baynik. This is the departure between me and you, you know, because he wasn't patient. So he didn't get all of the knowledge that we were hoped, that even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, I wish Musa could have stayed longer so we could have learned more. <laughs> this is our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also encouraging us on the importance of seeking knowledge, right? But because he didn't have the patience, you know, because he's seeing things, Musa Alayhi Salaam was being tested. He's seeing things that he knows apparently are wrong, <laughs> you know. But Khidr told him in the beginning, you know, you're not going to be able to, to take it, you know, basically be patient. You're not going to have the patience to deal with this because Musa is known in ordering the good and forbidding the evil. So when he sees something that's conflicting or appears to be conflicting with what he's taught or what he knows, he's obviously going to be upset and he's going to ask questions. So the point of the story is that Musa, being one of the great messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, humbled himself and went on his journey to seek knowledge. And he said he would do it even if he had to travel years. Right? And this is from the greatest of the prophets. So about us, how about us? Also, in seeking knowledge, um, it doesn't matter like what background, background you come from. You know, knowledge is like a level playing ground. There's a story of uh, 
Yaqub, a young boy. Uh, many might know, you, know him by a different name, but when he was young, he was known by that name. And he was a poor, very poor boy. His parents would send him to a tailor to learn the apprenticeship of sewing, you know, so he can have like a stipend from the tailor and make some money on the side for his family. Some scholars say he was an orphan. Some say he wasn't, but all are in agreement that he was from a very poor family. And so he would go every day to, to this apprenticeship, to this tailor to learn the skill and make a little bit of money to, to give to his family so they can get by, you know. But as he's going, he noticed there's like a lecture and a lot of people around this, this sheikh, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. So the boy would sit and stop and listen. And sometimes he would get so enthralled in the dars that he forgot about his work. And then the tailor would come complain to his parents and say, you know, your boy missed work again. And so after some time, the parents got upset and they went to Abu Hanifa and said, look, you know, we, we're a poor family and our son is, you know, helping us with this little stipend that he gets, you know, every week from his tailor and learning this skill also so he can become a tailor. But your lessons are distracting him. Can you please tell the boy to, to stop getting, coming to your class and go, you know, work like he's supposed to? And Abu Hanifa said, you know, leave him seek the knowledge. لَعَلَّهُ يَأْكُلُ مِنَ الْفُسْتُقْ let him attain that knowledge because maybe one day he'll eat from this pistachio. Pistachio, I guess not just the uh, pistachio itself, but they probably made some nice, very nice dish that only the rich people at that time could eat, right? And she was like, yeah, right, whatever. You know, we don't even have money to, to buy f food for ourselves. You're gonna, he's going to eat from this like, very extravagant dish. And Abu Hanifa said, whatever it is, what's the stipend? I'll pay double or, or whatever it was. He, you know, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was very generous. He paid even more than you know, whatever the stipend was so he can, the student Yusuf can come and sit with his uh, tulab in, in, in the lecture. So long story short, he became one of his best students until he became known as Qadi al-Qudha. So all of you know him as Abu Yusuf. Al-Qadi Abu Yusuf. One of the first persons to ever have that title, Qadi al-Qudha, the judge of all the judges in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Islamic empire. And he was the mustashar of Harun al-Rashid, the khalifa of the ummah. The ummah that expanded from Spain all the way to China. <laughs> right? He was the head judge of all these people. This poor little boy, some say orphan boy or very poor boy, you know, no background, too much in knowledge, no wealth. And he became one of the greatest scholars of the ummah to the point the khalifa would ask him for, uh, for fatwas and, and, and uh, you know, to clarify questions and he was the head judge and they say in a story that you know one day they were in a gathering and he had you know been passed this this sweet and he ate from it and he asked the khalifa what is the sweet and he said this the fustuq and he remembered abu hanifa saying way back when he was a little boy that one day you might eat from this and he remembered how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him in rank and he you know tears came to his eye yarfa allahu ladina amanu minkum wa ladina utul almi darajat Allah will raise those who have knowledge and levels. In another extreme, Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, he was raised as like a prince, basically, in extreme richness and extravagance. And, um, you know, they say that most of his teachers were like women at the time. You know, his, like his father had many, you know, servant girls and stuff like that. And they taught him, but they taught him well. They taught him, you know, poetry and Arabic and stuff like that. But he wasn't too much, they like, say, at the time, in one narration, like, too knowledgeable in the, in, in, the, in the deen sense. So one day, the story goes, he went to the mosque, and, you know, I think he was going for a funeral prayer or something, but, you know, before the funeral prayer, he, uh, you know, sat down uh, waiting for the prayer, and then a guy comes and hits him on the shoulder and says, get up and pray two rakahs. You know, when you go in the masjid, you're supposed to pray two rakahs. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, and he got up and he prayed two rakahs. And then... I forget exactly why, but the other day he came back to the, to the masjid and, uh, you know, he said, I know now I have to pray two rakahs, so he prayed two rakahs. And then a guy came and hit him and said, you know, you don't pray two rakahs, it's asr. After asr time, you can't pray two rakahs. And he got really upset and confused. And he's like, these ignorant people are telling me about my deen, you know. And he went back and studied and he became one of the greatest scholars of Islam. You know, so these two extremes, you have one from a very poor background and one from a very rich background. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him both honor and, and, and kirama because of the knowledge. And to this day we know about both of them and their works are with us. Also, it doesn't matter how old you are. You know, Imam Kasai, he is one of the qira'at of the Qur'an that we recite from the seven qira'at. He is one of the imams that have a whole qira'at 
after him, right? And he studied, started very late in age. Yet he became the most proficient person of the Qur'an at his time, and he, we have a whole narration of the Qur'an through his uh, riwayah. Right? So being older didn't stop him either. Also, it doesn't matter if you had a previous lifetime of falling short of Islam, for example, or falling into sin. There's a famous story about Malik ibn Dinar, who was one of the great scholars of Islam, that he wasn't you know, religious. In fact, he, they say you know, in one of the narrations that he was the opposite. He was a guard and he was very like shadid, ghilal, you know, like kind of mean and, and cruel and did stuff he you know, should, not be, should not have been doing in terms of drinking or other stuff like that. So anyway, the story goes one day he uh, got a servant girl and you know, he had a daughter from her and this daughter became like his beloved in terms that it changed his heart, he changed his ways, he left all that bad stuff, he started being softer in the heart and like every day from uh, leaving work that was like his you know, happiness to come home and see his daughter, right? And he, he started becoming better, alhamdulillah. Um, and they say that the daughter one day, you know, he came home and, he, and she had passed away. He came and asked for her and the mother, you know, told him the bad news and he was so upset that he fell into a stupor. He went back to his, you know, bad ways and, and did, you know, stuff stuff for Allah till he fell into a stupor. And they say that in this, when he was knocked out, he had a dream of a snake chasing him, right? And he was running and running and he saw like a mountain with children on it and he was running towards that mountain. Then he saw his daughter and he went to his daughter and he was so happy. And she said, أَلَمْ يَأْنِنِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ isn't it time for the people who believe that their hearts should humble with the remembrance of Allah? And he woke up and he made tawbah and he went and started studying the deen until he became one of the greatest scholars of Islam. So don't let anything hold you back from seeking knowledge in the deen. You know, make the time and make the effort and have the sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you want to learn this deen so that you can lift the ignorance from yourself and you can worship Him correctly and you can teach others the goodness of this deen. We finished in terms of the cure of ignorance is knowledge.